Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? I don't know which person asked for the snow today, but <laughs> no. I have a friend and colleague, Pastor Christer. He used to be the pastor in Belleville before I got there, and then he went down to uh, Michigan, and uh, he would pray for snow often in the prayers, and I bet you he's up to no good today. So thank you, Pastor Christer, somewhere. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. It's wonderful to see you here this morning. Welcome to those of you who are worshiping via the live stream as well. We are delighted to have you joining us as well. I'd like to welcome any visitors and guests who have joined us today, whether you're here in person or watching via the live stream. We hope that you'll find a bit of peace of heart and mind, some comfort and hope, encouragement and welcome among us today. Today, our liturgy is the uh, service of the Word, and for those who wish to use the red hymnal, you can find that uh, beginning on page 210. Otherwise, the slides on the screen here will provide all that you need, and for those watching from home, it will be obviously broadcast onto your screens as well. You will notice we have some flowers uh, here in front of the font and on the altar today. The flowers that are... Um, in front of the uh, font are uh, for Joan Eichmeyer, who died on March the 7th and whose funeral was this past week, and they've been placed there by Kathy and Perry uh, Benoist and their family. So our deepest condolences to you, and uh, we wish you many happy memories today, and thank you for sharing these beautiful flowers to uh, brighten up our worship space today. Flowers here on the altar are given in remembrance of Roy Seaman, who uh, died six years ago on March 15th, uh, 2018, and he is loved and missed by Shirley and their family. So thank you to you guys for providing flowers as well, and we wish you many happy memories as well today. Today we continue on in the season of Lent, and we are exploring the idea of well, we're going to hear in the readings about losing life in order to save it, which might sound like a bit of a contradiction, but once we allow the, the week's readings to move us into Jesus' kind of understanding of things, it does, from a certain point of view, make perfect sense. The struggle, though, is less about understanding what Jesus meant and more about how we actually find the courage and the faith to live into that call. So may our worship lead us into losing our lives, and I'm not talking literally, of course, but losing aspects of who we are in our lives that don't feed and don't, um, you know, build us up for the sake of the gospel so that we can truly find our lives. May we all continue to know and feel the presence, the love, and the grace of God for each and every single one of, of us again in this place or wherever it is that we are worshiping today. I invite you now to take a moment of quiet reflection and centering as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. I invite you to please stand as you are able. We'll join in singing our opening hymn, number 576, We All Are One in Mission.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit is with you all. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Inscribe on our hearts, God, the love you have for us, the life you give us, the constancy of your presence with us. Inscribe on our hearts, God, the call to follow you, the longing to know you, the compassion to love as you do. Inscribe on our hearts, God, the story of salvation the part we play in your purposes, the vision of your dream for all creation. Inscribe on our hearts, God, all that you hold in yours, or at least as much of it as we can carry. Amen. I invite you to please be seated as we hear our readings. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31. 
The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was married to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and write in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Did you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within? Remove my sins with his up and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken rejoice. Oh. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my wickedness. Give me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 5. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As God says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. I invite you to please stand for our gospel acclamation. Thank you. 
This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servants be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. I have, <clears throat> excuse me, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it, and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. In the name of God, who makes and renews the covenant with us every new day, amen. I invite you to please be seated. <clears throat> when I was a lot younger, in my confirmation classes, maybe around the age of 13 or 14, I remember asking in the middle of class, I asked my pastor why we in the church talk about Old and New Testaments in the Bible. I don't remember where the question came from, but I do remember that our reading from Jeremiah 31 was one of my favorite passages as a young man, and it still is today. My pastor immediately answered, Rob, in our modern world, we assume that the new is better and that the old is meaningless and irrelevant, but that was not true in the ancient world. That has always given me a lot to think about, especially as a pastor who's called to serve a denomination which wrestles with maintaining the traditions and the status quo while at the same time trying to find new and meaningful ways of doing ministry and being the church in our modern world. There's not a day that goes by without me wondering what we can do and how we can do it to keep our role as a church in our modern world meaningful and relevant, while at the same time not causing too much collateral damage. And sometimes, you know what, it can work really well, and sometimes <laughs> it just doesn't. But I suppose the faithful struggle is what is most important. Jeremiah chapter 31 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because it offers us hope. It reminds us that things will not always be the way that they are and that things can, if we put our head and heart in the right places, they can get better. And of course, as with so many things in the Bible and the church and in our modern world, that's always a matter of perspective and interpretation. The prophet Jeremiah writes these lovely words during a time of great upheaval in the lives of the Jewish people who have just been defeated by the Babylonian Empire and saw their sacred temple and the holy city of Jerusalem burned to the ground. Their priesthood has been executed and their leaders have been sent into exile into Babylon. Put yourself into these people's hearts and minds. They are feeling lost, hopeless, deserted, afraid, 
and very uncertain about what the future holds. Jeremiah reminds the people of who they are, reminds them of their covenant with God and of who they ultimately belong to. And he tries very hard to offer them hope that things will not always be this way. But the life of a prophet is not an easy one, trying hard to help people see things differently or to act differently or to live differently or to think differently. Trying to help people change old habits and old ways of thinking is always challenging in any era of human history, but here Jeremiah is telling his people that God will continue to renew their covenantal relationship, especially after a horrible experience like their tragic defeat and the exile. Jeremiah reminds them that God's love for the people, for the world and everybody in it, is unending. Would a God of wrath and judgment who despises people want to renew a loving and committed relationship with those people? Not likely. God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is giving the Jewish people who hope for a return home from exile a chance to renew more than just a covenant relationship. God is giving these people a chance to start their lives anew, to rebuild not only their sacred city of Jerusalem and the holy temple and their homes and villages, but this is a chance to rebuild themselves and their lives. So what is a covenant and why was it so important? And, you know, basically and very simply, a covenant is the most ancient form of a legal contract between two parties. So each side promises to do something for the other, and as with modern legal contracts, if either side doesn't follow through on their responsibilities, then there are going to be certain consequences. Nothing as dangerous as death, maybe a fine, or an increase in taxation, or levies of troops, for example. Covenants were the most common form of making a contract or a promise with someone else. All the biblical authors have done, and again, it probably comes from the priestly class, is taken this form of contractual responsibility and applied it to a working relationship between God and the Jewish people. God promises to bless and protect the Jewish people in return for their worship and their living by a certain code of religious and political conduct, which we know as the Torah or the laws of Moses. Even as we today live with a renewed covenant made through Jesus, sometimes it works well, sometimes not so well. The same is true for the ancient covenant. Sometimes it worked well and sometimes it did not. The Jewish people had and continue to have this covenant with God that says that we are called to be examples to the rest of the world of an alternative way of living in this world and an alternative way of being the world. Now, of course, this does not always work out well. Remember that God told the Jewish people that their experience of slavery in Egypt was to never again be made a reality for them or for any other people on the earth. But you know what? That's easier said than done, as we can see by the many negative experiences that Jewish people have had in their relationship with other cultures, religions, and many empires. Sometimes you make your own mistakes. Sometimes things happen that are beyond your control. Again, God, in Jeremiah's reading, is giving the people another chance to get it right or to do it a bit better, another chance to learn to be more the people that God had hoped they would be from the very beginning. And isn't that true of us today as well? Doesn't God give us the infinite second chance to get things a little bit better, to experience more, to learn more, to make more of who we are and of our lives? Doesn't God renew the covenant relationship with us every single day? I certainly believe that that is the case. For me, I am reminded of God's renewing love and grace in many ways, but no more so, so than when we share Eucharistic hospitality. 
I believe that in the bread and wine, I am reminded that the way things are is not the way that things will always be. I know that I will not always be the way that I have always been either. Well, at least that's the hope. (laughs) That is the power of a covenantal relationship that's made real in the bread and the wine of communion because it can transform our lives by reminding us of who we really are and whose we really are and what our role as people of God really can be. By the life-affirming and life-changing example of Jesus, that new reality, that renewing of covenant and hope is made real in the covenant of our communion hospitality. I often think back to those words that my pastor spoke to me that day so many years ago. In our modern world, it is the new that we focus on. We work hard to rid ourselves of the old. What do you do, for example, with an old computer or laptop? I suppose you can make a doorstop out of it or you can go and recycle it. What do you do with an old couch or with your old clothing? But in the ancient world, the opposite was true. It was the old that was considered to be the tried and true. That was what what really worked and what you could trust. It was the new that was suspect because it had not yet stood the test of time. Now, please don't misunderstand. Sometimes it is the new or the renewing of the old that we need in order to move forward. This is something that Jesus and Paul make very clear, but that did not mean that they got rid of the essence of their Jewish faith. In fact, they used their ancient Jewish traditions and faith to bring about the changes that were needed. What Jeremiah is doing in the reading this morning and what we experience in communion hospitality is a renewing of the old. The old is being renewed. It's transformed. And to quote my favorite scholar, John Dominic Crossan, it's even being turbocharged. We should never talk about biblical covenants or testaments as if we are getting rid of the old. God is renewing that which is tried and true, but doing so in ways that must continue to be meaningful, relevant, and persuasive in our modern experiences of life and for the modern world in which we live. Jeremiah's new covenant is a renewal of the original covenant made all the way back at creation with the entire world, a covenant which basically says that as long as people are in this world, as long as people continue to struggle with their humanity, as long as people need to be reminded of their need for God and that relationship, that God will be there to bring us hope and healing and wholeness, reconciliation, love, forgiveness, and peace, not only to us, but to everyone. Now, this relationship, Jeremiah says, is not a relationship that will be easily taken for granted or ignored because it will be very much a part of our human DNA. Or as the prophet writes, it will be written on our very hearts. Now, if we want to ignore that covenant relationship with God and the world, well, you know what? That is our God-given right. But in doing so, we are going to be leaving ourselves vulnerable to apathy and indifference, things that we have far too much of in this world already. God's covenant with human beings is to help us become passionately involved in the renewing of this world by being passionate about the world and the people that God loves very much. Because we are loved by God, we are called to enter our lives by loving one another. And again, I give thanks for your example, excuse me, of these good things through our work in ministry and mission together, because we do renew hope through our kindness. We do renew lives through our generosity. We do renew peace by our love. Our work in ministry and mission with the covenant that God has made with us really does matter, and it really can make a big difference. And that is what Jeremiah is trying very hard to remind his people of in the story this morning. 
That is what Jesus tried so hard to remind his followers of. And that should continue to be our priority as people of faith as well. God's covenant with us is also and always a reminder that our past does not follow us into the future, unless, of course, we just can't let it go. But that's our problem, not God's. This renewing of the covenant, this renewal of hope, renewing of our passion for our lives, the renewal of peace and freedom and love is meant to free us from ourselves and our guilt and shame so that we can go out into the world to bring a little more peace, some healing and wholeness, and just maybe a new beginning, a second chance for people who need it. And you know what? That might be you, and that might even be me. Amen. I invite you to please stand as you are able. We'll join in singing our hymn of the day, number 861, When Long Before Time. We now take a moment to confess our faith. I invite us now to use the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
The love, the grace, the peace, and the light of Christ are always with you. Let's take a quick moment to share signs of those things with each other. I invite you to please stand as you're able. Join us singing our offertory hymn. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all good things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding all the world with your love and grace. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to please be seated as we enjoy this choir anthem.
Thank you so much, choir. What a beautiful song. Do you want me to use it? Yeah. Uh, just in case. <laughs> As we enter our time of prayer today, I invite us to reflect on this beautiful reading from Jeremiah chapter 31 and the renewing of the uh, covenant relationship, the renewing of love and hope, the renewing of, you know, peace and friendship. Not, I'd like you to reflect on what does it mean for you, but what does it mean for us as a congregation? What does that look like for us as a community? What does that look like for us as a province, as a nation, as a world? How do we make those things more real? by being inspired by our faith and by the good that we see around us. Um, you know, and it's not always a perfect place in the world, so how do we go out there and help make it better for those who need it? Let us pray. Trusting Jesus promise that we will be heard, we offer our prayers for the world God loves, the church God calls, and for all people according to their various needs. Today we are invited to respond to God of our Lenten journey with Hear Our Prayer. How can we ever understand the mystery of your love, O God? How can we ever estimate the value of your compassion and mercy? In our weaknesses and brokennesses, in our strengths and wholenesses, we find the touch of your support and creative energy. In our fears and suffering, in our joys and pleasures, we find the moistness of your tears and the percussion of your laughter. In our failures and despair, in our successes and dreams, we find the comfort of your forgiveness and the inspiration of your spirit. These are gifts beyond measure, and we can only respond with joyful praise. You are the home we long for, the family where we discover that we truly belong, the hearth where we are warmed and renewed. And we worship you with our whole being, wonderful and loving God, God of our Lenten journey, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are alone, ill, afraid, depressed, overwhelmed, and angry, that hope, joy, justice, and new life will find them. We pray especially for all those on our prayer list and for all those that we name in the quiet of our hearts now. May we in our own ways be a warm heart and smile and an open hand and mind. We await your coming in every moment and in every experience. God of our Lenten journey, hear our prayer. In defiance of corruption and falsehood, we commit to truth and integrity, and we pray for honesty and uprightness to increase in the world. In defiance of apathy and hatred, we choose to be proactive in love and we pray for understanding and peace to increase in this world. In defiance of skepticism and cynicism, we embrace the mystery of faith, and we pray for humility and wonder to increase in this world. In defiance of self-interest and human arrogance, we celebrate your salvation, and we pray for compassion and faith to increase in our world. In defiance of all that would oppose your purpose among us, we choose again to follow Jesus, and we continue to pray, not just now, but at all times. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There are a couple of quick announcements to share with you this morning. As we have heard in previous weeks, our uh, Congregational Council has designated the season of Lent as a time for food drive to help support our local food banks. The boxes are set on the floor by the bench in the narthex. Thank you to those who have already contributed, and we thank those who are all, uh, considering uh, also providing more items there. So thank you for your generosity 
uh, towards those who are in need in our community. This coming Saturday, March 23rd at 9 a.m., is our interior cleaning of the sanctuary. Again, this is when we are going to be going up a bit higher and cleaning those areas that cannot be reached during the weekly cleaning process. We encourage you to uh, bring your supplies. And again, if this isn't incentive enough, donuts and coffee will be supplied. Um, So please join us for that. Many hands can help make this a lot light work. A reminder that the Church Council would like responses uh, to the hopes and dreams survey that I provided to you within the next two weeks. We would like them back by Easter Sunday. Um, We will take that information, tabulate it, and we'll take a look at it and see what it is that you have hopes and dreams for for this congregation, and we'll see where we can go and what directions we can turn, what new things we might be able to try. Please also make sure to check the back of your worship guide for all of the services and events that are coming up. Please note that next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and it's the beginning of Holy Week. Where did Lent go? My goodness, the time just seems to fly when we're having fun. Um, We will also be making sure that, uh, and I'd like to invite you, please, to wear something red next week. (laughs) There is a bit of method to this madness. I'll explain more next Sunday. But if you can, please wear something red. Are there any other announcements, or have I overlooked anything? All right. I invite you now to receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us with grace and with compassion. May the Lord continue to look upon us all with deep love and give us and our world deep and lasting peace. Amen. I invite you to please stand as you are able. We'll join in singing our sending hymn, O God Beyond All Praising. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and your neighbors. Thanks be to God.